Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, so compared to to a lot of the other tasks or a lot of the other talks, uh, this one will be a little bit different. It's basically um, I'll look back at what we did at Cleverbit. Unfortunately, the company isn't around anymore. Uh, we are in liquidation, but that's a different story. But we learned a lot of things from actually creating the system. And um, I think we're we're just going to dive in. Uh, a little bit about me. Um, you already heard it. I'm developer advocacy at TimescaleDB. Uh, so as I said, the company Cleverbit isn't around anymore. Um, so I joined Timescale, uh, and Timescale is actually the the time series database that we use at Cleverbit. So there's kind of a little bit of a story, um, but I've been with a lot of different companies in the past, uh, from Ubisoft or Hazacast, uh, Instana, a lot of cool stuff. And I most of the time I tended to stay in like developer relations for the last ten years or so. Uh, but I'm coming from a very strong engineering background, and everything te backend technology, everything performance, that's normally my fair game. Um, contact information, if you want to tweet stuff to me or on Mastodon, uh, feel free to do that. So um, we're, we're at Neo4j, so th this section will be super, super short. What's the graph? Um, that's a graph, and that is a more beautiful graph. Um, a little bit of an outlook of what we what we look into in the in the near future uh, with this with this talk, right? Um, so that is what the system um looked looked like in the end you see there's a lot of interconnections between the different nodes um but what we had to do and we're diving into what Cleverbit specifically did in in a few seconds um we had to connect that to time series so time series is anything like measurements for iot devices uh anything financial transactions and stock prices yes that is the bitcoin price a couple of months ago uh beautiful isn't it um Observability metrics, uh, as I said, I've been with Instana, so observability is all about time series and graphs and interconnections between different uh, independent data sets, uh, making no uh, or creating knowledge out of all of that, um, but also the Marvel timeline. Um, and that is actually a fairly complicated time series, at least to, to what it is today, right? Um, if you want to deep, uh, dive deeper into that, the slides will be available afterwards. This is a super, super interesting data set. It's, it's quite impressive and, and scary how big the Marvel Universe is by now. So um, because we're at a graph database com uh, conference, I thought it's important to, to, to give a point about what time series data is. And time series is normally the time-related observation of a subject. So how does a temperature, how does humidity, how does um, wh whatever, how does anything changes over time, right? So that is just for the folks that never used time series data before, time series database before, that is what the time series is. So how do we end up here? And I said uh, the company isn't around anymore, but at Cleverbit, we mo first and foremost created hardware, hardware for monitoring uh, exactly those kinds of things, temperature, humidity, ammonia level, CO2, all the kind of stuff, but at a very specific location uh, because it actually was collected in animal barns. So we were in the industry of animal husbandry, um, not um, growing animals ourselves, but trying to help farmers, trying to help the industry to, to optimize animal welfare, uh, optimize uh, for, for quality, um, but also uh, m giving the farmers the incentive to produce better, well, I don't want to say quality, but, but um, more organic in a more organic fashion, having less animals, but still making money out of that, right? So that, that is the general problem with all of the hus animal husbandry industry. Um, farmers need to have a, a ton of animals to make the buck. And we tried to save that or try to change that. It didn't work out um, for a lot of different reasons. Um, but that is something, uh, or that is what the system looked like. Um, we we uh, collected a lot of information. We made predictions. We gave them alarms and, and ideas of how to optimize, um, how to prevent anything um, medical issues, so less medication, less antibiotics, all the good stuff that we as customers wanted. Um, and the first thing we try to do and, and try to help them um, in the very beginning is they, by law, they have to keep um, like 
uh, reports, like daily reports about spe specific information. Normally, they have to measure it themselves. Uh, obviously, we could optimize that because we had those data 24-7, right? So we, we try to optimize their general life and, and their behavior and, and, and do some cost cutting. So when we when we started, uh, we or so from, from a clever bird side of view, we were like four people in the beginning. It was like me, uh, two people coming from the hardware in, uh, development industry, and one person actually being the last couple of years in in like the chip acquisition or chip um, uh, 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 selling industry, but he was um, a trained farmer. So he kind of knew uh, what we're up to. So we, we sat together and it was probably me and, and my na naive uh, like expectation, but how complicated can a farm be, right? You have a couple of buildings, you have maybe a couple of animals, you have a couple of devices. That, that must be super simple, right? So you have your farm, right? You have one or two barns, multiple buildings, maybe three barns, and you have some devices and animals in that. Uh, for, for, for chicken, you collect data by herd. So how, no matter how many animals are there for uh, pigs and, and cows or pigs and cattle, uh, you have to actually go down to the, to the animal specific level. So if there's a medication given, you have to collect those data on an animal level, not on a, on a herd level anymore. So that was my expectation, right? So guess what? We have a couple of metrics. So how complicated can that be? Uh, we look at that from a, a relational point of view. So we use Postgres because I'm a Postgres fan. Um, so you start with a relational data model. You have some farm object. You have some barn object. And you have some animal object. Cool. Um, we've seen there like in a tree structure, right? You have the farm, you have the barns, you have the animals, the devices are in, in, in parallel to the animals. So cool. Um, we, we had a parent ID, which was either farm, barn, animal, device ID, something like that. And the type basically said, what kind of data object is it? To make it a little bit nicer, uh, we used like an, uh, a view that had all the hierarchical data. Um, Nothing fancy. Uh, it worked great. Um, so we, we added some order uh, while we actually aggregated this view. Um, and yes, uh, you guessed it. Uh, the view has some recursive SQL, right? So it, it kind of looks like that. Uh, you create a materialized view. Uh, you do some recursive SQL magic. Um, for people that have never seen it, uh, recursive SQL basically means you're joining uh, with your previous iteration of your uh, your your view um, over and over again until you have some kind of like end terminating um, uh, operation, um, and it worked right. It was it was good, no no problems here um, except for well it became more and more complicated, right? Uh, so you, you start with like super nice model. Uh, you, you're trying to be like very specific in how you do this SQL stuff, right? We all learned how to use relational databases. So, but at some point you're adding more and more and more objects um, and you fall back into this like, hey, you know, we have like an entity uh, with some ID and some specific type. And then we have a JSON object, which has all the additional data information. Um, yeah, right. Um, we, we, we had good plans. We loved what we do, um, but we added more tables and more object types faster than I could update it. And the problem is every time we added a new object, uh, we had to add this, like, or we had to update this um, this view, and that is just like the simple version, right? That is already uh, in in a in a later fashion. So that is where we came up with, like, you know what? Let's go with entity, and it's much easier. We don't have to update everything, um, and we started to migrate uh, old tables into the entity fashion, but we didn't go through with that. Um, but it worked, right? Um, yay! Uh, we got our data. Um, the 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 query wasn't compli too complicated. Uh, we we had um, 
to help our functions, like basically um, um, give me the uh, child hierarchy and give me the parent hierarchy. And you gave it a start and an end call, uh, a start and end object. And it tried to figure out if there's actually a connection between those in the tree or if there is no, uh, no connection at all. Um, if there was no connection, the result set was empty. Otherwise, you got everything or whatever you were asking for back in between. So it was not a graph, it was a tree. That was my expectation, at least. And it worked great until we added more and more and more objects. Uh, somewhere around the, I don't remember, like 100,000 or something, stuff started to get slow. And I mean slow. Uh, we went down from like two or three milliseconds to something like 500 milliseconds. And we had a lot of those lookups because we need to make sure that we get all the correct um, devices, that the devices were accessible by the customer. So there was not just like one tree lookup. Every single request had at least three or four of them. So we ended up having, out of, this, out of the blue, basically, uh, we had um, response times of more than a second. And, and that was, OK, uh, we need to look into that. Um, and we are in Postgres, and there is a lot of good stuff about Postgres, right? Postgres is a great database, so why not just look around and see what we can do? And guess what? Postgres is something which can be used out of the box, which is the L tree extension. So the L tree extension basically represents a tree in some kind of a label fashion, a searchable label fashion. That's the cool thing. So you create this like label whenever you insert an object. And the way it works is it uh, creates a specific index that's very, very fast searchable uh, or queryable. And that's cool. So we, we're back to, to where we were before. Just now we have one column more, which is the path which is this like L tree label. And the path kind of looked like that. So you basically have, yeah, we, we used UUIDs for any, anything object ID uh, because it was the simplest thing. So what we did is every, every object was represented by its UUID and the, the type um, as some label point. And L tree basically created this path, like the canonical path, like in Java or .NET or stuff. Um, and it basically says that the custom, uh, that this farm is underneath the customer and the barn is underneath the farm. So far, so good. As I said, there is a specific index on top of that. And it was super, super fast for querying. And we've been back to milliseconds. That was cool. That was all good. Uh, no worries here. It was all very nice and very fast. So it seemed like, yay. So here we are again except for that over time I learned um, with every new customer that we onboarded, I learned more and more that farms are actually not as simple and not as cool as our initial like um, closed uh, beta, closed alpha, whatever customers, right? So we had some people while I was building the system, well, that, while we were building the system that actually fit this model really well. It was all good. And then we started onboarding more, and we figured out that, as I said, farms are actually not as simple. At least a lot of the times they are not. So let's keep back or go back a little bit. So just take a simple example, only one barn, right? We have one farm, we have one barn, very, very simple stuff. But especially with, with pigs and stuff, and even chicken, you now have compartments which slice down the barns into multiple smaller chunks. And let's call it that. And there's actually barns that may have more than one floor, right? So you may even have something in between the barn and the compartment because you may need to know if it's floor one or floor two or something. So, okay, compartments, cool. Um, it's still a tree, right? Um, then you have inlets, which slice the compartments down even further. So compartments could be something like uh, piglets and, and uh, 
slaughter pigs, right? So while they're growing up and at a certain stage you move them over, uh, they may need to have a, a different um, like registration number. That's why they're compartments and why they're often separated by a wall or something. But in especially for pigs in the compartments, you now have even smaller things where only like three or four pigs are together. Um, so there's like less fights and, 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 and less like that. Anyway, still cool, right? You have the animals and the devices. Um, sometimes multiple inlets have the same device, so you can just add it to the compartment instead, right? It would still be visible. Um, still a tree, um, except for now the really complicated stuff starts. Um, we started to add water meters into the system. And water meters can be really weird um, because they often are like, grown, historically grown systems, um, especially barns that are a little bit older. So they started with one water meter and then they sliced down the, the barn in, in between and, and added a wall in the middle. So they had to add a second water meter, um, but not every water meter is like only one compartment. Uh, so you see in this example, you see the first water meter goes for the first and the third inlet and the second one goes for the second and the fourth inlet. Um, you may have a weather station on the system or on the farm itself, which belongs to all barns and all compartments and all inlets. Um, and specifically for chicken far, uh, barns, you may have like one weight scale, uh, which is only in one specific compartment or one barn. Um, but guess what? Uh, because they're all getting the same uh, animal feed. They're all coming into the barn at the same time. They're all going to the production plant at the same time. They only have one weight scale for all of them. So now you have one data set, which belongs to all of the other inlets, all of the other compartments, all of the other barns. And that is not a tree anymore, right? And, and that's not all of it. So we were looking at that and like, Huh, that actually looks like some kind of an acyclic graph. We didn't have cycles, at least not to the point where we where we closed the company. Uh, luckily, because I really don't want to uh, want to mess with cyclic graphs. Um, but we had an acyclic graph. So here is where all this like thing went down the rabbit hole. Um, I remember there was a good friend working at some company doing something with graphs. So I asked him, like, hey, Michael, uh, does, does that sound, I, I think I have a graph problem here. Uh, could, we, could we hop on a call and see if that is really a thing, right? So we, we, we dropped on the call and I explained what we had and the answer was like, yes, that is actually a graph. And it's it's a fairly good graph. It's it's clean and nice. So I looked at our data model and sat down for the next couple of days and tried to come up with something that looked like a meaningful connection in terms of nodes and and uh, 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 um, node connections, right? Vertices and and. Uh, um, <laughs> well, can't come up with the name right now, sorry. Um, but I, I tried to bring it into a data model uh, that may be more like a little bit graph related. So that is the first iteration of that. And then I tried to connect all of that together and that is what it kind of looked like in the end. So we had all those objects and the objects had children somehow, right? We, we still had to represent this like graph nature. Um, and that is just what we had at that point in time, right? So that is all that we kind of built out uh, with plain SQL and references um, and foreign references and all the kind of stuff. Um, and you see there is already a quite nice graph and I imported a lot of our data objects and just had it render out. Uh, and that is what it came up with, right? So that is just like between the different um, labels and um, how they are connected. Um, because that is like super unhelpful. Uh, here is a better example. So that is actually a farm. Um, and you see that there is really 
a lot of connection. And as I said, that is only the data model we had at that point in time. That still didn't solve any of those issues like, hey, um, I need to reconnect this uh, animal weight scale uh, to multiple inlets, multiple barns. Uh, that is just like the standard data model. It's already nice. Um, and we don't only have like the, the farms, uh, but we also had all of the um, like uh, value added chain behind it. So we had the feed mills that are the ones that actually create the animal feed. Uh, we also had some connections to the production plants, um, but uh, to the to the breeders, all the kind of stuff, right? So on on a bigger picture, we actually see that there is quite some connection between them. Uh, there is some outliers. Uh, so we had companies that didn't really use a lot of the system. They only had like um, the data passed through through our system into to their own system. That is basically on the on the top left. This like weird red orange blob. Uh, for example, that is a customer that had all the devices registered, uh, but there was nothing else. But the rest of it is actually fairly connected. Um, and it doesn't have all the connections here. But uh, you already see that there is like these little clouds of, of objects. So we, we were looking at that. And, and while we build out this data model, um, the first thought was like, that must be something like building automation, right? Um, I mean, in a building automation system, you have the same problems. You have um, an HVAC that is connected to multiple rooms, maybe not all of them in the same building because you have multiple HVAC systems and stuff like that. So there must be somebody who tried to solve that for us. Um, so we, we, we kind of shopped around and the first thing I found was Proje Project Haystack. Um, it's actually a fairly nice system. Um, they 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 are around for quite a while. They have like a really weird data model, to be honest. Um, but it, it was something that we looked into for for quite a while because we wanted to solve those additional issues. Um, and one of the uh, issues with a weight scale or a water meter, for example, was like, okay, how do we separate? different temperatures, right? You have like um, a room temperature, uh, indoor temperature, you may have an outdoor temperature, you have a water temperature, you have a device temperature, you have all those different things and you may need to, to dig deeper and, and, and provide more context on those in the future because for further predictions, we need to, to separate those things out. And Project Haystack was okay, it's kind of extendable. Uh, it was not really nice. Um, obviously, the W3C has something for that. I think there today there's, uh, it's like the Apache Foundation. If you're looking for something, there's probably something from the W3C. Um, and for them, it's the building topology ontology. Um, it's a super, super complicated, um, uh, um, a super complicated uh, 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 um, a system. Um, I, I didn't really dig deep. Um, I looked at that and it used the RDF like syntax for, for querying objects and, and adding objects. Um, I, I may get some, some um, people disliking me now, but I don't really like RDF, so I skipped that. But what we came up with, and, and that was actually not one of the like top results, which is unfortunate. Um, because I find it uh, really interesting, especially when you're already looking at remodeling data into a graph, is the brick schema. Because brick schema basically is a graph. That's what they do. I mean, building ontology is, as I said, RDF, it's a graph. Haystack kind of is a graph uh, the way that it is stored. But brick schema really uses the typical graph features. And that's cool. Um, so we, we went with that. Um, and they, minimize to the very, very basic level. So Brick Schema is, um, is uh, a system that which is extendable or extensible. So you can use any of those like schema definitions and extend it over and over again. And, and you get the inheritance of all the, the uh, attributes and all the behavior changes and all the kind of stuff. But what they do is they basically say we have four different types of things. We have equipment, which is devices, sensors, anything that may create data points. Uh, you have a data point or a point class, which is a temperature measurement. It's um, 
uh, uh, humidity measurement, it is a device location, it may be a weather, uh, it, uh, like like uh, wind information, all the kind of stuff. Um, and as I said, they're all extensible. So you can say, hey, I have a point, which is a temperature. It's measured in Celsius. Uh, here is your conversion to, to a Fahrenheit and Kelvin. Um, and then you make like a subclass out of that and say, hey, but you are actually a water temperature. Um, and then you can say, hey, I have an equipment object, which is a water meter. It gives me a data point of class water uh, temperature. And, and it inherits all of the behavior before. And then the third object they have is a location. And the location could be anything. Um, we internally called it zones. Um, that is something that I found earlier. Um, but um, that is basically all they have. And then they have a lot of different relations between the different nodes. Um, I, I just used like the three uh, most common ones here, which is feeds. That specifically solves the issue like I have one weight scale which feeds information into multiple locations. And that is great, right? So you have one weight scale and you just feed in for, you just connect it to multiple uh, location nodes and say, yes, um, this object or this data point is being fed into all of those. Um, has part is basically my has a relationship. So a location can have another location, can have another location, um, or an equipment can have um, more equipment elements, like um, a device can have multiple sensors, um, and the sensors have uh, the data points, right? And that is the third one, which is has point. And if you, if you, and, and that one is is taken straight from the documentation of Brick Schema. So that is basically how they describe it. Um, we did those things with uh, near for J labels, which was a great use case uh, for the labels because we had some things which had multiple labels attached to it. Right? You may have a location which in itself again is an equipment and provides data points, um, and and that could be something like. Um, a barn has a barn door, and the door may be open or closed, right? So the barn itself is the location. Uh, it has um, an equipment, which is the barn door. You could also model that separately, but we said, okay, barn can be open or closed. Um, and, and, and then you have a data point, which is open and closed. Um, and, and you can see that they specifically do this. So the AHU1A, like the topmost uh, brick entity, it actually feeds into two different objects or two different other elements, um, uh, entities, uh, which are connected somehow. And, and that is really cool, right? So also things like outdoor temperature, stuff like that. And we built that into Near4j, um, and, and, and it came down to, hey, I need all the equipment that is somehow fed to a location, or that somehow feeds into a specific location where the location is reachable from a certain customer. So we, we used the two um, data models uh, from, from Brick Schema and the one that uh, we came up with um, for the, the brick schema for anything starting from the farm, basically going down into the actual um, device and, and data point level, and our data model on top of that, where a customer um, was um, actually uh, had access to a location and it had permissions to a location and stuff like that. So that was how we how we build up all of that, and and, and the queries were. A little bit more complex sometimes because we also had to check permissions, but permissions were also part of the uh, near for j data schema now. Um, so the the queries in itself were like really nice and simple. So um, what did we learn over that, right? Um, you do not simply just create a data model. Um, I, I tried it. I thought I know what I was doing. I, I thought I understand how the system works and, and how barns are created. Um, but it's always more complicated than that. Um, really do your research. Um, but on the other hand, we were a startup. Uh, we had to do iterative development, but it was quite a lot of overhead. Uh, the other thing that I personally learned, if you have a co-founder, 
And he says, I'm a learned trained farmer. Uh, I know what I'm doing. I know how this stuff works, but he has no technical or very few technical background. Don't believe him. Do your own research. And that is not to, to uh, put the blame onto my co-founder. He did all everything he thought was correct. He gave me all the information. The problem is there was like a disconnect between the the a domain knowledge and my technical knowledge. And we just didn't figure that out until uh, we had to rework everything. The other thing that I learned, and you may be scared now, um, if you have a data system or a system that looks like that, where basically every service goes down to a database, um, as I said, uh, we we had to iterate fast. Uh, we added a lot of stuff, um, but it ended up that, for example, the customer object was read basically by every single microservice. Um, so just moving the customer object into near 4 j was like a massive undertaking. Um, and in the end, we ended up um, adding a slight layer in between uh, a different set of microservices, basically one per type uh, or one per resource type. So we had one. Um, a microservice, we called it internal customer service that handled everything, mutating and non-mutating operations for customers. It also gave us the chance to, um, to actually put the object into, um, in, into a cache um, when, we, um, uh, 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 when we created it once because the objects were sometimes more complicated. We enriched them with a lot of additional information data from the time scale uh, time series database straight away. Um, and then we just cached it away. And because now everything was in this like resource layer, um, it was super simple to extract it and, and to move it somewhere else without anyone else noticing. But if you have something like that, expect there to be fire and expect there to be month and month of rework. Um, I guess that is not specific to anything uh, time scale or anything near for j It's just something you have to expect when you're trying to move from one data model and one database to another thing. Um, also, uh, it's often important to just clean out all stuff. Um, what, what I mean with that is your, your idea or your feeling, uh, which is correct from yesterday, is not necessarily correct today. It's really bad to to stick to something just because you sat you 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 moved there, right? Like uh, we moved with the L tree thing and it worked great, uh, but we I I knew it will not solve it. Would it Would there be a way to solve it in no, uh, in, in in Postgres directly? Most probably yes. Would I rebuild and graph database? Most probably yes, right? So always reconsider uh, what you've done in the past. And there, sometimes there is hard, pills that are hard to swallow, uh, but it's always worth it. Um, in the end, um, Neo3j uh, was great for us, or in general, like the graph data model was great for us. It gave us a lot of opportunities. So uh, with that, I think everyone should have a graph database. Um, there is more data. So from the point, the, or the second on, I said, OK, that is probably graph data model. I looked at more and more use cases, and you find them over and over and all the time, right? So everyone should have its own graph database. And I think that's important. Um, and with that, uh, graphs are super nice. They're simple. They're easy to understand. They're actually much easier to understand, even for non-technical people, um, than a relational data model, because you can actually show the graph. And, and thanks to like direction of, of the relations, uh, people that are non-technical are still able to understand it. It was a lot of help for me to bring down a lot of the issues and the problems and the technical limitations um, or, or explain them to my co-founder. And with that, I think we're out of time and I'm out of slides. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'll be around in the chat for a few more minutes uh, and happy to answer questions. <laughs>